I'm super excited for the session, Compassionate Choices, because I think compassion is something that drives all of us in this room and at this conference in our daily lives. And the speakers who you'll hear from today are working on um, driving compassion in their work and they're enabling and encouraging the public and institutional agencies with choices that are more humane to animals in their work. So we're going to learn what programs, activities at, that our amazing speakers are doing and to see if these strategies could be applied to your communities. We're going to explore the power of compassionate choices and shaping a better world for animals, the planet, and for ourselves. And joining us today, we have Joy Lee um, from Compassionate Choices Network Coordinator at ACT Asia. Joy Lee is the Compassionate Choices Network Coordinator and Caring for Life Officer at ACT Asia, heading up the organization and development of the CCN Annual Plant Forward Campaign. With more than 20 years of experience in international animal welfare, including project management, organizational development, human behavior change campaigns, and humane dog population management programs, Joy is still passionate about human and animal behavior, strongly believing in change for a better and more sustainable future. And with that, I'll hand it off to Joy. Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you? It's the last session of the day, so how are we all feeling? <laughs> Okay, great, um, I'm in the way. Is this better? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me all right? Okay, great. So uh, thank you all for coming. Um, really excited to be here. Um, my name is Joy and as uh, Sam introduced me, I'm the coordinator for the Compassionate Choices Network. So I'm re really excited to be speaking to you about compassion and compassionate choices. Um, So I work for an organization called Act Asia, and we were founded in 2006, and we started our work in China. Um, our main programs have been running in China now for over 17 years, and um, our vision is a compassionate world for animals, people, and the environment. Um, we take action through education, compassion through education. Um, our main programs are children's education program, professional education program where we work with veterinary doctors and we also provide teacher training. And then our third pillar of education work is consumer education. We started out having a program fur free campaign um, on uh, working with the Fur Free Alliance. And from that work, we see a need to spread out and work on even more compassion-based uh, consumer education. And that's led us where we are today as we've started promoting plant-based um, sustainability. Uh, Act Asia has been accepted by the UN into the Conscious Fashion and Lifestyle Network for our work um, and for free and also awarded the UN Good Practices Award for our children's education program in China. So for anyone working on those topics, if you're interested in know more, please come and find me afterwards, um, but we won't be talking about that today. Um, so what came out of our work in China uh, after 15 years was that we see a need to help the organizations in Asia to come together and speak with a unified voice and to magnify our voices. And so uh, ACT Asia launched the Compassionate Choices Network in 2021. Um, it is a network uh, made up of NGOs, social enterprises across Asia. And the idea is that it's a, we're proposing solutions for Asia by Asians. Um, we're collaborating on social change to prevent harm to animals, people, and the environment. And ultimately, our goal is to build a movement of compassionate consumers in Asia. So the Compassionate Choices Network, the CCN, we have four main areas of focus. Um, one is food, where we're promoting plant-based diet. The other, the second is clothing, where we're promoting cruelty-free, sustainable fashion. Uh, the third is home or living, where we're promoting, again, cruelty-free living, cruelty-free products, and eco-friendly products. 
And the fourth area is travel, uh, promoting energy saving and low carbon emission uh, modes of transport. What is very key for the CCN and also for Act Asia's work in general is that we are strong believers in the One Health message and also in the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And everything that we do is very much linked into promoting One Health and the SDGs. So currently in 2023, the network spreads across nine countries with 11 organizations. Um, and you'll see up there on the map uh, the logos of our um, member organizations, many of which are uh, here today at the AFAD. We started in 2021, um, and in 2021, we were just coming out the end of COVID. So um, it was a year where we were just getting together, getting to know each other. Um, and in 2022, we brainstormed to think, what can we do as a network across the region? And the idea was uh, uh, brought forth that we would run a regional human behavior, uh, human behavior change campaign. And that led to the birth of Plant Forward. Um, the name of our campaign is uh, Plant Forward. And as you'll see that there is a logo up there for a global week to act for the SDGs. Um, our action is registered with the uh, S Act for SDG campaign. And this has now become an annual event put on by the Compassionate Choices Network across Asia. Before I jump into what Plant Forward is about, I want to tell you a bit about why Plant Forward. So in this conference, in this meeting, we've heard again and again and again about Asia. What an amazing place this is, but we also have, uh, we're also going through a period of socioeconomic growth. It's leading to increased consumption, not just of meat, dairy, but increased consumption in all consumption. Um, as people are gaining social affluency and more money, then there's more of a mobility, they're um, able to uh, put their money into what they want, and therefore we feel that it's the right time to step in and promote consumer education to build a movement of compassionate consumers in Asia. Asia has over 60% of the global population. Um, if we're looking at around 4 billion people, small changes by each of the 4 billion people will create a massive impact. And that is why Asia as a region is such an important focus. Whatever we can achieve here, it means a lot. But as we've already heard, in terms of animal agriculture, it's growing. Um, the amount of animals being factory farmed in Asia, it's growing. And therefore, Asia as a region has got to be an area of focus. And this is where uh, the Compassionate Choices Network and Plant Forward campaign comes in. The, the Plant Forward campaign is also unique in that it is also a, a tool for us to build our compassionate network in terms of um, capacity building in practice. Um, we are able to build trust and relationships as we work together on this campaign. And most importantly, we use this campaign to highlight uh, an Asian leadership on global platforms and show the world what is happening right now in Asia um, by some of the leading Asian organizations. So there's a very strong capacity building component in this Plant Forward campaign that as the organizations join this campaign that they will also be able to build capacity as well. Um, so like I said, this started in 2022, last year. Um, and it was a trial, it was a pilot last year. We started out with three languages. We had Plant Forward in Chinese, in Japanese, and in English. Um, we ran a small-scale sort of plant-based cooking challenge across China, Japan, and Singapore. Had over 300 entries or so across the three countries. And um, you'll see some photos of the winning award entries from, uh, from these competitions. We also ran six 
online events. They included doctor sessions um, about the health benefits of plant-based diet. Uh, we also ran some cooking demonstrations with some chefs around the different countries. And uh, one of our uh, CCN members in India is actually a social enterprise built around plant-based health. They're called Sharon. Um, they're an absolutely amazing organization of, comprised of doctors, nutritionists, and uh, we had two bonus videos as well from Dr. Nandita Shah. And um, the idea is to promote plant-based diet, not talking a lot about animal welfare, as we've heard from the other talks, but actually focusing on the benefits to human health um, and bringing a positive spin as to why this is good for you to adopt a plant-based diet. So last year was our first year. Um, we had the in-country cooking competition plus the online events. And four out of the six members took part last year. All of our materials were translated across three languages. Um, it was an online campaign only because we were just coming out of the COVID situation. We didn't plan any offline events. And uh, by, the, by November, so it ran <clears throat> from September 17th through the 4th of October, um, just over two weeks. Uh, we had 1.6 million in social media reach, and we live streamed the events in China and in Japan with over 10,000 views, um, and like I said, over 300 competition entries on plant-based uh, plant recipes. By the end of the campaign, the end of, no uh, end of October, we had reached over 2.5 million in social media reach, and that was our first year. And for us, that was a pilot. We wanted to know if there was interest in the region for something like this. And also, we wanted to see how well, as a network, we would be able to work together and coordinate something across multiple countries. And so in 2023 this year, um, we have grown. And as I said previously, we now have uh, nine organizations, uh, sorry, 11 organizations across nine countries. This year, we were absolutely thrilled that we were able to present in five to six languages. Um, you see above there that we've got Chinese and Japanese and Korean. Uh, we have a special version for the Philippines called Go Gule. Um, and we also have a special version for Tuvalu, who is an amazing country um, in, in the Pacific, and I'll talk more about them later. So, oh, I'm running out of time. Um, this year, I wanted to focus on human behavior change. So we took that idea of a vegan challenge and we ran it as a 10-day challenge, making the bar really low for, to, for participation. We didn't ask people to go vegan for 10 days. We asked people just to swap one meal per day. Um, for 10 days and run through the 10 days and we would offer prizes for people that made it through the 10 days. Um, we created social media groups. Uh, they posted their daily meals on the social media groups. We also created uh, recipe books that we shared online, five recipe books, five different countries. Every country had their own social media group so that it was all um, facilitated within the local language. We also had seven online events. Again, a very strong showing of doctors uh, talking about some very common diseases like heart diseases, um, diabetes that can be managed and treated uh, with plant-based diet. And also, uh, again, the cooking shows are a popular hit. Um, we talked a lot about plant-based nutrition as well. And this year, we were able to hold in-country events. Um, we had uh, several potluck celebrations across six cities in India. Um, in Korea, they also had online event promotions from uh, their corporate partners. In Philippines, they had an online campaign. Um, in Indonesia, we focused on the zero food waste theme, and that was a, a separate um, but part of the Plant Forward campaign as well. In Tuvalu, they have a cultural cooking competition. And in China, we had a compassionate choices and sustainable lifestyle exhibit in Shenzhen. So this year, we were able to have in-country events. Um, and we were really excited about that and definitely planning to build on this next year. 
Uh, so in terms of the outcomes for this year, uh, nine CCM members in eight countries, and we had over 70 partner organizations sign up, uh, corporate as well as organizations who are partners in this campaign. Um, the seven online events were live streamed in six Asian countries, and that was across Facebook pages from our CCN members in the different countries. We've had over 65,000 views of the seven online events, uh, both on live stream and replay so far. Um, our media content was offered in English, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and Indonesian as well. And our social media reach currently is around 10 million. Um, that's 50 plus pieces of content, but each piece of content was translated into the different languages. So 50 pieces times the different uh, translations, and that's quite a lot. Um, what I'm most excited about is human behavior change, to be able to measure what's actually happening on the ground, that taking it off of just being a social media online campaign, um, because we've had the social media groups, and in China especially, um, with it being the Act Asia office, that we were able to coordinate the campaign locally in China a bit more, we were able to engage with the people who partook in the 10-day challenge. We had over 900 people sign up for the 10-day challenge across five countries. And, Roughly about 25% of the people who signed up actually completed the 10 full days, and that's based upon the data from China. Um, also, over 800 people attended local offline events. And we did a follow-up survey to the participants in China, and we found that 58.5% were either omnivores or flexitarians. So we wanted to make sure that we were not preaching to the converted, that it's not just vegans and vegetarians who were taking part. So we were extremely excited that we almost reached 60% of the participants were actually trying this for the first time. And an overwhelming 97% of the people who responded to our survey said that the Plant Forward campaign has inspired them to continue exploring plant-based food. And that is something that we're so proud of in terms of the results. And these are groups of people that we will continue to foster relationships and working with them on their journey for change to make sure that this change in behavior um, continues through. And then lastly, the Plant Forward campaign was recognized by the UN SDG Action Campaign on their official social media channels. Um, our CCN members were registered um, in each country as part of the Global Week to Act for the SDG campaign. And this is something we're very proud of as it brings recognition to all of the CCN members globally that they're being recognized for the work that they're doing in their country, but as well that we're having a collective influence regionally. And then lastly, just very quickly, that we've done a lot of capacity building through action in this campaign as well. Um, the CCN members that work with us, we, we sort of, we get to teach them and, and walk them through social media content creation, social media strategy. Um, we've provided financial support. We are currently in the middle of doing post-campaign analysis that we will be sharing with everyone. Um, there's like skills building in terms of how to do live streaming across the different channels. Um, and basically just amazing teamwork. Um, alongside each country having a unique, their very own cultural identity. Our social media materials are tailored to each company, but are, sorry, each, uh, each country, but at the same time, it is collective part of one whole campaign. Um, and also the friendships that have come out of this teamwork has been uh, something very beautiful to see. So uh, for next year and in the future years where we're hoping to Go with this campaign is to continue to exp expand Plant Forward, not just focusing on plant-based diet, but also go into uh, sustainability, Plant Forward in terms of a sustainable lifestyle, in fashion, in home, in living, in transport. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so basically we will be meeting, the, the network will be meeting to strategize and plan what we will be doing over the next uh, next year, next couple of years to come. 
and I'm out of, running out of time. So I uh, just want to say thank you again for uh, coming and listening to this talk. We're very excited about Plant Forward and the Compassionate Choices Network because we feel like it is the first movement of its kind that is trying to implement such a massive campaign on a regional scale um, collectively so that it's unified in messaging um, to reach uh, such a large uh, targeted consumer group. Um, and based upon the data that's coming in, we are seeing that it is having an effect. So we look forward to using this campaign and the network to build this movement of compassionate consumers in Asia. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Joy. Um, and I encourage everyone to submit questions on the WOVA app. If you have any questions for Joy, we'll do some Q&A at the end. Thank you. And next I'm going to introduce Naveen Dorbakala, one of our students at the conference who is a co-founder and co-president of the Harvard undergraduate plant-based. Naveen is a student at Harvard University with a self-design major in sustainable food and health systems. He is the co-founder and co-president of Harvard Undergraduate Plant Base and co-founder of the Food for Thought Festival. And I'll let Naveen take it away. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining this talk. It's truly an honor to speak with you all today. Um, I'm going to be talking about my journey with building a plant-based movement at Harvard. Um, but before I go into that, I wanted to tell a little bit about my story. So I basically decided to go vegan um, at the start of college because um, I had seen enough um, and decided I needed to act. And um, what was really interesting is the moment I got there, um, I pretty immediately struggled um, with finding options for food to eat, with finding a community of people who are like-minded and who thought about the same issues as me, and also opportunities to learn more about it as I was just navigating um, being part of a new college and trying to find courses and research opportunities and, and anything really uh, related to these issues. So kind of coming in with that context in mind, um, it was very obvious to me that something needed to be done about these issues. And um, from speaking with many other students now, I've realized that this is not just an experience I felt, but one that many of us have struggled with um, for a while now. Um, so where it all started um, was basically I took a class um, at Harvard, the only class at the time that was related to um, animal welfare. And with the professor, we had this idea to start a workshop um, called Plant Futures, Equipping and Empowering the Next Generation of Leaders that will accelerate the transition to plant-centric food systems. And this is sort of where my journey into this um, advocacy work started. Um, and at this event, we basically came together, um, a mix of students, faculty, um, and people who were not just at the school, but people um, from other schools as well, other organizations. And we talked about what we can all do to envision a better future for um, all of us, um, for the animals, um, a plant-based future, um, and what that would look like at Harvard. So we sort of set the stage, figured out what our plans were. Um, and since then, I've basically liked to characterize what we've done as, as being part of four main phases. So I'll go through those uh, one by one, starting off with the first phase that all plans must go through, which is actually creating the plan. Um, so. We started off by surveying the landscape at Harvard. So I did a deep dive into all of the course opportunities that were related to um, food, related to animals, plants, etc., and found that there were 103 courses across the schools, um, undergraduate and graduate, related to these issues. Um, 103 courses might seem like a lot, but that's actually only 1% of all of the course offerings available to students, which means only 1% of the courses even, and this is even mentioned, food, um, plants, or the relationship between food and the environment, which is particularly concerning, especially since environmental systems classes are such a big and important and interesting topic for many students. We also surveyed um, a couple hundred students across the schools and found that there was a lack of an adequate discussion on food systems, and many people felt like this was the case. We also found some more interesting data on student preferences around food. 
and more particularly that a majority of students, and this was across multiple surveys that we did, um, wanted more plant-based options offered in the dining halls. Um, and that was pretty quickly a clear sign to us that something needed to be done with bringing more access to food to students. So the second um, step was creating partnerships. Um, and partnerships take many forms, but I think for us, the primary goal for this was to connect with the faculty on campus who could potentially um, teach classes, um, find opportunities for students, and also just wanted to help students learn more about these issues. The students themselves, of course, who, who wanted to be part of this movement or just were curious about learning. The dining hall services, which, we proved, uh, which proved an important partner um, as we navigated the process of um, changing the food options. Um, various offices that were able to provide more financial support and institutional support. And lastly, companies outside of um, the school who could provide some more support in terms of um, getting the word out, helping us with our campaigns. Um, and we went to the Plant-Based World Expo last year, and that was kind of our first um, interaction with the plant-based world more broadly. And it was a really cool experience where we got to learn a lot from different people. So the next was pitching ideas. We attended a few poster presentations, a few workshops, talked about the idea for starting a club, um, talked about the idea for including more students and more initiatives on campus um, related to these issues. And we found that there were a lot of students who really wanted to get involved with this sort of a thing. Um, there were a lot of people that were not just students, um, but faculty as well, like I mentioned, who were really interested in helping out. Um, and we quickly, slowly started to build out a team. Um, and with this team, we decided that we would have a model that we would sort of try to abide by in terms of what we were doing at the school. And that was providing education on these issues, um, building a community around them, advocacy work in terms of actually getting the word out around why it's important, and generally, and perhaps most importantly, is providing support. Because support was something that students felt like there was a lack of throughout this entire process of navigating starting a new journey in college. So phase two is launch. We have the ideas, um, we have a plan, now we get going. So, um, last year, we decided to launch Harvard Undergraduate Plant Base, which is basically the Vegan Students Club on campus. Um, so the mission is to provide a community for passionate advocates for plant-centric food systems. And we sort of attack, we tackle this from various vantage points, mainly being social justice, public health, environmental sustainability, and animal welfare. And I think it's very important to recognize that most students coming into the college aren't coming in with the idea that they're going to pursue a career in animal welfare um, or nonprofit work per se. So I think it's important that we are trying to capture as many different groups of people who are interested as possible. And as we continue to talk about how these issues are intersectional, um, more and more students find themselves getting interested in um, the animal welfare side of things. Um, this is just a quote from our uh, lovely advisor, Dr. Saha, um, about the importance of, pla of plant-based diets for various levers um, of society. Um, so just to provide a quick year in the recap, since now we are coming on our second year, um, we started off from scratch and we built out a team of 11 board members of students, 13 advisors, and about 70 plus general members across the schools. Since the start of this year, we've expanded to now 15 board members, um, 15 faculty advisors, and around 180 students across all the schools. Um, and those are students who are not necessarily vegan. In fact, a majority of them are probably um, consider themselves flexitarian. Um, but we try to capture, again, like as many students as possible. Uh, we also establish partnerships with various student orgs and institutions across the schools. Um, and we expanded the availability of plant-based options in the dining halls, um, which was one of our main goals. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we also compiled more and more survey and research data to figure out what students wanted and continue to do so, understanding that this is an ongoing process and um, we want to obviously be trying to advocate for what students want. Um, and we hosted various events. Um, and in our first year, we had approximately 500 plus different attendees at each of the events. Um, so this is some pictures of, of some of the events that we threw, mainly, like I said, community building, um, documentary screenings, um, socials, um, speaker events, uh, et cetera. So um, now that we've started this club, um, we've done a lot of work um, in building out an institutional climate. So what does that mean? So um, the first thing is, like I mentioned, going into college, my biggest concern was that I wanted to study 
plant-based food. I wanted to learn about food systems, but there were no opportunities to do that. So um, we created this plan to sort of get more support for students. So the first one was to campaign for discussions of plant-based topics to be included in classes where they're relevant. So for example, classes that talk about the environment should be talking about food and agriculture and how those affect the environment. Second is to ask the administration to invest resources and in funding into programs related to plant-based studies um, and again the intersections with various other issues that the university already puts money into. And third was to develop a new food focused concentration or secondary field which is still an ongoing effort um, that I'm going to talk about right now. Um, just to provide updates on where those projects or initiatives have gone. So last year, um, Harvard launched the Great Food Transformation, which was the first course on plant-based food systems ever offered at the school, also taught by Dr. Saha. Um, and that course had about 100 students um, attend, and it was a huge success in getting um, more support for these issues on campus. We also launched um, some engaged student grants um, that were specifically targeted at students who were focusing on plant-based food issues. Um, and the Radcliffe Institute, which is one of our good partners, um, launched the Feeding the Future Symposium, which was, a, which was basically intended to spotlight uh, different food-related research initiatives. And lastly, the project that I worked on for the entirety of last year was creating a major um, called Sustainable Food and Health Systems, which I'm now taking, um, and I'm very excited to be able to take that as my um, path that I'm studying now at school. Um, but that process was a huge effort in terms of getting people to support um, teaching classes in those issues, getting the right courses um, to actually be included in the curriculum. Um, but ultimately now I'm able to take classes that I really enjoy and I'm passionate about. Um, we also ended up doing a lot of initiatives in the dining halls as I mentioned. Um, and we have a lot of takeaways from these initiatives because I think at the end of the day uh, we did make a lot of progress but there's a lot of setbacks that we also faced. So the main things that we were able to accomplish were we were able to get a plant-based dessert option, um, ice cream, into all the dining halls this year, um, which was super exciting. Um, and then we also were able to expand the greens and grains station to include more diverse plant-based protein selections. So it used to just be raw tofu. Um, now we have legumes, there's um, seitan, there's a lot of other options as well. Um, and we also made sure that there was one vegan alternative to each grill option um, item. Um, and as a result of those initiatives, students now feel like they're able to eat a lot more food, um, and particularly students who have dietary restrictions or vegan and vegetarian students. Um, but we also face a lot of setbacks. Our goal was to create a more friendly vegan climate. Um, and while we did do that, there are also some challenges in terms of getting um, certain options that people want to be offered. Um, but I think the main things that we've learned from this are, one, you have to take it one step at a time. Um, and obviously, you can't ask for an entire overhaul of the dining hall system that's been there for years. Um, and there are small changes that we can make over time that I think ultimately do end up accumulating. Framing is key. Um, and that kind of works hand in hand with the next point, which is about working directly with the staff. I think it's really important to understand that, um, you know, the dining halls are trying to serve students. Um, but at the same time, um, they also have their own, you know, financial considerations and constraints that you have to take into account. Um, and really thinking about how can we optimize the experience for everybody, not just necessarily what we want, is, is really important um, in terms of, you know, how you're advocating for these things. I think also experimenting and tracking the success of the interventions is important. Making sure that you have data to back up the effectiveness of what you're doing. Um, and if it doesn't work, just try again. Um, and if it doesn't work again, then maybe think about other ways that you can um, advocate for the same um, changes. So phase four, um, just briefly wanted to talk about kind of what we're doing now and um, where that sort of, sort of fits in and where people might be interested in um, getting involved potentially. If, if, you're, if you're interested, please feel free to contact me after as well. So the exciting initiative that we just launched this year is called the Food for Thought Festival. So the Food for Thought Festival um, is supposed to be a um, intercollegiate initiative to basically get students um, at colleges, it's completely student run, um, to talk about food systems and their food choices. 
Um, and our goal is to create a festival that is an immersive experience, um, including a lot of food options, but also trying to include a conference um, with more workshops around getting students to talk about um, these issues. And, and ultimately, at the end of the day, we're trying to get people who are not already involved, right? People who are kind of on the fence or, or trying to learn more. Um, and we also want to incorporate a lot of components that are unique to college experiences. Um, and also leveraging a lot of the cool opportunities we have at college, such as a virtual reality studio, or um, 3D printing, um, or tons of different institutions who are doing a lot of other cool work, and how we can integrate that into something that is run at a university. The second thing is we launched the Plant World Video Project, um, and we are basically collecting video series of um, why plant-based is important from various vantage points, um, and we're trying to highlight the core values of compassion. Um, and we're planning to bring together various perspectives and release this project hopefully in the next month, um, and will be an ongoing project to continue to collect voices and to highlight these perspectives um, to students, but also just to anybody who would be interested in learning about it. The final thing is the University V campaign, which we're really excited to be working on, which is basically trying to coordinate a global initiative to pressure universities to offer more plant-based options. So a lot of universities have had success um, with getting more plant-based options. A lot of universities have not. We think that it would be very effective if we were able to combine our efforts and launch a um, multifaceted front simultaneously. Um, so we think catering could be a good point of intervention, but also thinking about what would make the most sense and most, be most effective in getting schools to shift. And also thinking about, you know, what are the different contexts. So right now we're working a lot with schools in China um, and looking to expand and work with schools in other areas as well. Um, but ultimately, everybody comes from a different experience. Uh, we all have the same struggles at the end of the day, and we really want to focus on what we can all do together to make the most impact at the same time. So that is it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Awesome. Thank you, Naveen. And um, just a reminder, any questions, you can submit them on the app. And last, we will wrap up with Rajiv Ariel, organizer of Cheat One Animal Save. Rajiv is a dedicated and compassionate animal rights activist hailing from the scenic landscapes of Nepal near Chituan National Park. Concurrently pursuing a degree in computer science and information technology, he holds key roles at, as a secretary at Animal Rights Club Nepal, organizer at Chituan Animal Save, and a website manager at Veg Voyages Foundation. And with that, I'll hand it off. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to start with uh, a Sanskrit slot. Uh, Sanskrit is actually the oldest language in the world. So uh, there is a saying, Ahara Suddho Sarva Suddhi, Sarva Suddho Durva Smriti, Smriti Labbe Sarva Ganthina Bipra uh, Mokshe. It means that uh, when the impression gathered by all the sense organ, including your food, behavior, and action is pure, your existence become pure. And when your existence become pure, then you can gain inner peace and satisfaction. This basically means that uh, if you want peace and satisfaction in life, uh, you have to follow a, a compassionate lifestyle, compassionate living. So uh, uh, most of you are already familiar with compassionate living, but still uh, I have some of the things that you need to, uh, some of the things that you need to follow or some of the choices you have for compassionate living. So uh, there is always choice on food. So uh, every meal matters. So when you choose a meal, uh, your choice will make difference to the animals in the world, uh, to the creatures uh, in this earth. Uh, uh, I think uh, already a speaker already mentioned about it, but uh, when you buy uh, household accessories, when you buy makeup uh, products, when you buy uh, clothing products, uh, please uh, have a choice. Uh, see if there is uh, cruelty free levels or not. Uh, this, this will, these little things will make a difference to the animals. So uh, nowadays, uh, 
having a breeded, having a expensive uh, pets is like a new fashion. And uh, if you want, uh, if you want uh, to be a good human being, if you want to live a compassionate living, then you should adopt a street dog, uh, give a home to the uh, um, uh, unwanted animals. Um, so have a companion animal that is rescued from a foster shelter, from a street, and uh, respect the wildlife and birds around your area, and feed the animals that is in your environment if they need it. And while traveling, uh, there are a lot of options. So uh, you need to be responsible while traveling. Do not pay for uh, pictures uh, for wild animals. Maintain your distance from the wild animals. Uh, do not support any forms of exploitation while traveling. So um, go to the sanctuaries if you can. Uh, support uh, different uh, rescuer organization if you want. And while celebrating, most of us uh, wouldn't be uh, most of us may not have knowledge about it, but uh, while celebrating, uh, we are still using fire, fire oaks, laser shows, and other polluting components, even if we are vegans, because we don't, we don't know that is uh, directly affecting the animals. So uh, as us, as a con uh, conscious people, we need to also uh, understand that while celebrating, we may hurt animals. Uh, we may, um, so we, st we should consider that uh, while uh, celebrating, we need to uh, be conscious about it, either if it affects animals or not. So I am here representing Chiton Animal Save. Chiton Animal Save is a uh, um, chapter of Animal Save movement. Uh, so what we basically do is we do vigils, we do direct outreach programs, we do awareness programs uh, um, to, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, we promote plant-based treaty. So uh, we what we basically do is uh, create a compassionate world for every living being in this planet. So before talking about what we do uh, to create a compassionate future for this world, uh, let's talk about the problems uh, we face while um, working on a countries like Nepal. So as the national anthem of Nepal says, Soyo Thunga Fulka Ami, uh, it means a uh, garment with hundreds of flowers. So there are more than 123 languages and cultures in Nepal. Uh, with that, they are, they are separate cultures, separate traditions, and separate values. So uh, while advocating about animals, while talking about the rights of it, Animals, if you go directly about the, if we go directly against their culture and values and uh, or their sentiments, uh, there can be a problem. So that is one of the challenges we face in Nepal. Uh, uh, as Nepal is a developing nation uh, between India and China, uh, so we do not have any access to um, ocean. And for centuries, this was isolated from the rest of the world. So. Uh, everything is new to Nepal. Um, before five or ten years, uh, there was not even internet in Nepal. So uh, still, it is still developing. So the information about veganism, animal advocacy is little late in Nepal. So that is also challenges for us uh, as we are working in country like Nepal. And the uh, last thing is uh, native languages. About the uh, languages, uh, there is so little much uh, knowledge and information and content in our native language, Nepali language. Uh, most of the uh, people, uh, most of the uh, people in Nepal do not relate to the contents and information from around the world because uh, they are not um, uh, uh, remotely related to the contents that uh, old creates about the veganism, about the animal advocacy. And, um, 90% uh, of the people uh, do not even understand the English um, contents about the veganism, about the animal advocacy, about the compassionate education. So uh, we as a uh, Chiton Animal Save uh, use these strategies uh, to, uh, to raise awareness about the compassionate living in Nepal. So the first is most common, it's not a new strategy. So everyone knows about it. And uh, it is just a reminder that uh, we should let people know about the uh, uh, cruelty in dairy industry, cruelty in meat industry, about the choices they have in life, uh, about that they can make a difference to the life of living being. The next thing is, uh, it is one of my favorite campaign, and it's working. Uh, we've been working on it for two years. So uh, I think it is one of the most effective campaign of ours. 
what we basically do is we organize different summer camp and uh, winter camp uh, for the students below the age of 15. We call them, um, we call them in uh, different campaigns. Uh, we call them in uh, different camps. Then uh, teach them about the basic difference between plants and animals. How plants do not feel pain, how animals feel pains, about the nervous systems, and why you should respect animals, why you should love animals. So, uh, you must be wondering why uh, only children, why not adults? So, uh, we as a human, uh, we, uh, we contain natural capacity of compassion, natural capacity of compassion, uh, essence of life, uh, loving feeling to animals. What we as a society is responsible uh, for desensitizing the violence uh, to the children. Children are born with their natural instincts. Children are born with their natural instincts to love animals, uh, to show respect and love to the animals. So it is really important for us to guide them about uh, positive change uh, towards the animal, to guide them about understanding the feelings of animals. Uh, ne this is not applicable for big cities where there are lots of opportunities, lots of uh, foods already available. So for places like Chiton where people don't, know, don't even know about uh, plant-based foods, about the plant-based protein and uh, plant-based meats, so testing, uh, food testing events can be really useful for creating the awareness. Uh, we need to let them know that there are choices for, uh, there are alternatives for meat and you can have uh, different choices to, for, uh, for the rights of animals for uh, compassionate uh, living. So this is also not applicable for the big cities. Uh, if you are in big cities, you can't go in everyone's home. So if you live in a society like ours where everyone is friendly, you can go to everyone's home, uh, you can talk to everyone, and um, they won't call cops on you for entering their property. Uh, to, to those places, to those society, this can be useful. So we go to uh, every door, we knock on every door, we talk to people, uh, we, we tell, us, uh, tell them about what is compassionate living, uh, we tell them about plant-based living, so what you should do uh, to have a peace and satisfaction in life. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Nepal was a country with uh, multilingual, multicultural and multi-religious uh, people. So uh, if it is a problem, there is advantage too. So there are many communities who love animals, who respect animals, they believe in Ahimsa and um, they, they, there are communities who, uh, um, who want to fight for the rights of animals. So uh, you need to find those communities and collaborate with them and um, talk to them, um, join them, and um, convince them that uh, if you want to fight for the animals, if you want uh, a compassionate living, then a uh, plant-based lifestyle is really helpful for that. So uh, if you want people to know about your campaign, if you want people to know about your activism, then you need to join them and only then uh, they, they want to join you, only then they want to learn about you. So documentary screening is uh, most common in everywhere around the world, so it's not a new thing, but still uh, it is really important to uh, change the perspective of uh, uh, people, it is really important um, uh, to change the perspective of people living in your area. So our uh, main documentary is about Momo Issa uh, doubling famous in Nepal. So what we do is uh, we create a video that, that reverses the food on the plate to the animals, how the food is uh, created uh, on the table. So when they see that video, most of them won't be interested to eat that dumpling uh, from that time. So even though we are working, um, we are doing our best, there are some challenges, uh, there are some uh, problems existing in Nepal that we can't solve. So uh, the animal rights movement is just starting in Nepal. So before five years ago, uh, I, think, I don't think there were much uh, activists in Nepal. Even now we can um, count the number of activists in Nepal in fingers. So it's just um, starting. So, uh, uh, it will take a lot of time, it will take some time to uh, create weak changes, uh, but we are still fighting for it. And the next thing is uh, topology and lifestyle. Nepal is a mountainous country, so uh, 
for uh, most of the people uh, in hill area, the internet, the road access is, is still not available, uh, let alone the animal activism and other information. So uh, communicating that uh, information to them is really difficult for us. And uh, for some of the people, their lifestyle is so low that animal husbandry is only their profession. And uh, for the people in mountains, uh, animal transportation is only way of transportation. Without that, uh, there can be no transportation. There are no roads to uh, solve problems like topology and lifestyle. We can't uh, change. We, uh, that, for them, that's not a compassionate choice. For them, that's, uh, that is a uh, compulsion. Uh, that's it. Hi, my name is Rajiv Parel. I'm organizer of Chitan Animal Safe. Thank you, everyone. Awesome. Thank you. We'll transition into Q&A now. Um, I don't see any questions in the app yet, so if anyone has any, you can submit them on there. Um, but in the meantime, I'll, um, I'll kick off with a question. Joy, I have one for you, because you talked a lot about capacity building, and that's obviously a very core part of what you do um, and fundamental for a lot of our work. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you define capacity building in your organization and how we as animal advocates should think about capacity buildings in our own work so that we're most effective? Um, yeah, so capacity building is a huge passion of mine. Um, I love working with people as much as I love working with animals. Um, but what I have learned in my two decades in this field that capacity building is something that we can talk a lot about, but in practice, because in the animal welfare field, we're usually so busy with work that it doesn't work to have capacity building as something separate. And so when we came up with this idea of building and uh, uh, having another, another network, the Compassionate Choices Network, we wanted to make sure that more than it just being a group of uh, organizations together, that it would be a group of strong organizations that's growing together. And therefore, making sure that as we use a practical experience like running a campaign, through this campaign we have organizations from very different backgrounds. So our um, network is not just uh, having organizations from animal welfare background, but we have environmental groups. We have um, the group I mentioned in India, they're actually a social enterprise of doctors. And it's really amazing to have people from these different backgrounds because then they bring their own perspective and bring uh, different uh, areas of expertise. And we're able to also help the, um, not help, but uh, allow a, a larger platform for the other existing members to share different ideas and see how different groups work. And so, um, pointing out or sharing the health benefits, for example, of plant-based diet, we have found to, uh, through this network to be one of the key messages that's been extremely uh, successful, that the videos that we put out, the interviews with the doctors, those are our most popular, most high number of views. And so there's a lot of interest from the public on how plant-based diet um, can help treat or manage a lot of very common um, diseases. And then as we work through the campaign, um, you know, we work together in terms of learning how to strategize. A lot of the campaign materials, the social media posts, it's actually started out and done, created by Act Asia. Um, however, when we hand it over to the local groups, our network members, then they come back to us with feedback. So for example, we created a video for the 10-day challenge, and then our group in the Philippines would point out um, a particular image at a particular time, it doesn't quite suit their uh, sort of cultural demo demographic. So even though we think we're all Asians, but in some places the Asian skin color is darker, in some places the, you know, the skin color is lighter, or the pictures of the food that is being shown is not, uh, doesn't fit with that culture. And so we've been making all these cultural adjustments, even though in the beginning the first video is a generic video, but then it would be tweaked to the lo local culture and also everything would need to be translated. And it's in that way that as we're able to work with the groups and they can see how a campaign is built um, and then we will, we will do the post-campaign analysis but also share the outcome with the groups to show them 
because everybody is implementing it in a slightly different way. We can show them what's worked in this country, what hasn't worked in this country, and everybody can share the learning together. And so it's a practical experience for capacity building, and then we can take exactly what we have learned and this build up capacity right into the plans for next year and build that into next year's campaign. And that's what I'm really excited about is that it's this collective capacity building as a network that also feeds into the impact of the campaign year on year. Sorry, that was a very long answer. Another <laughs> passion area of mine. Thank you so much. Super helpful tip for all of us, including myself. Um, we have a couple more questions from the crowd. Um, Naveen, how will you ensure that the program you started at Harvard won't end after you graduate? And I'm curious about this myself because I work a lot with university students too, and graduation is a challenge when leaders graduate and, and go away. So I'll let Naveen answer this. Yeah, that's um, a very good question, and I, I mean, I don't have a concrete answer in that I, I can't confirm that the program will last after I graduate. But uh, we had a pretty interesting experience um, at Harvard in particular because there actually was a Harvard Vegan Society um, until 2019 um, and it got disbanded basically before I came to school. And um, we had a conversation with the um, founders of that club to talk about kind of what happened um, and the biggest thing that they told us was just that um, you need to make sure that there's one, a structure in place that um, encourages people to take on leadership in this space. Um, I think that's super important. Um, so in terms of how like we've thought about, at least with our club, like structuring our organization is um, making sure that um, there are students who are actively able to be involved in organizing around these issues and are able to see the benefits of their own work materialize. And then, um, you know, we all work together and see um, those effects uh, manifest and we all kind of want to keep doing this work. Um, and then I think just making sure that um, we're trying to always actively connect with people um, who are, you know, in future years um, coming into the school who just went through the same experience um, that we went through and, and being able to relate to them and connect with them. Um, and then in terms of the, um, like, school program itself, I think that um, it, as it tends to be at schools, schools really do listen um, when they see that there's interest. Um, so, and, and that, you know, those, that students are going to make something out of it. So I think just really showing them that there, there is that interest constantly, um, I don't want to say throwing it at their faces, but like, um, you know, making it very clear that, that those people are there and that they want to learn about it. I think that's very important. Um, and, and I have conversations with people all the time just talking about, um, you know, wouldn't you want to like study this too, or, or or wouldn't you want to learn more about it? And I think um, once people start again getting involved, they do end up being more and more interested. I think that um, always having those conversations, always um, reaching out to people who might not already be in the circle, so to speak, is very important to keeping it lasting. Thank you, Naveen. Um, appreciate it. The next question I have is for Rajiv. Where? Oh, there you go. Um, how can advocates in the room support you with your work in Nepal? First of all, uh, we are just in the beginning. So every day, it's a learning phase for us. So every day, I'm learning. So even joining this conference and listening to all those experienced speakers, all those experienced advocates, uh, it will be really helpful for me in future. So uh, uh, from this room, if I can get only one mentor who will mentor me for a few months for my activism, it will be really helpful for me. So uh, if I can get mentorship from any of 
you. Uh, that will be really helpful for me. And about the activism in Nepal, we are very small community. We are still trying our best. So we can count our activists in fingers. So I want more community to grow in Nepal. I want more organizations. I want more or international organizations to come to Nepal. And that's it. so much. We're probably only going to have time for one or two more questions. I know we're running a bit over. Um, there's one more here. Let's see. It feels, and this could go to any of you, whichever, whoever feels called to answer it. Um, it feels like there is a disconnect between food generally and the people. Is this disconnect natural or artificially created? I mean, in terms of like the food that we eat um, and the ways that we think about like animals, I think that that's definitely something that we all we all can see. There's a disconnect with. Um, I think that. I mean, it's really kind of context dependent. Like there are a lot of cultures, um, different contexts where like food and humanity and nature are so connected with one another. Um, and I think that is um, something that we can often highlight, um, especially when people bring up that, um, you know, food is not related to, to all these things. Um, that it has been the case and, and is the case in, uh, for a while. Um, and I also just think that um, food is a huge connector in general, so it has the potential to, um, you know, connect to a lot of things, and, and those connections can often be seen and can't be seen. Um, but yeah, that is an interesting question. I'm not sure if I answered it correctly, but yeah. Um, I don't know if the question is about the disconnect between food or actually the food animals. Um, I think in terms of the food animals, this is something that we see, you know, everywhere. It's not just Asia, but it's very difficult to get people to come face to face with something that I think deep down inside, everybody knows it's wrong <laughs> um, because you're surrounded by it. And uh, I, I come from a family where, you know, my family is not vegan. My family is not vegetarian. I'm Chinese. And um, it's so deep rooted in our culture um, that it's very difficult to have these conversations. And even though my family loves their pet dogs and pet cats, but if I want to move that conversation beyond the pet dogs and the pet cats to talk about the food that's on the table, I will immediately get pushed back. You know, this is not the same thing. And it's not necessarily that they believe it's not the same thing, but it's what do they have to do themselves once they acknowledge the fact that it is the same thing? And I think that's a, a very deep psychological hurdle for people to have to, um, to face for themselves and then figure out how they're going to get over that. So for a lot of people within my own circle, I know that the conversation it's something that I will keep bringing up and I will keep challenging, but you almost need to bring it to, to them in a way where it's easier for them to say yes. So if I confront them about the animal cruelty, it makes them feel very uncomfortable. But if I turn around to my dad and say, oh, by the way, you know that all the animal products have you know, cholesterol and it's really not good for you and your last health checkup was not so good. And so basically I have all these medical um, evidence from all these plant-based doctors that I talk to that say how plant-based is so much better for your health. Then my dad would be like, oh, okay, you know, that I'm more willing to try this. And that's a much, much more comfortable conversation to have than to be talking about animal cruelty. And um, I would also invite you guys to go to the talk tomorrow on intersectionality with uh, Jeff and um, Boo as well. It's, it's very much about we all, we're all here for the same thing, but we need to think about 
what is going to work in each individual context. And something from my personal experience is different cultures. You can't just say the Chinese. You know, sometimes it's, it's very, very specific, um, whether it's within your own family or within a community, how everybody feels about this issue. We have to meet them where they're at. And change will come, but we need to be clever about it. If you keep banging on the same door, at some point they're going to shut down and say, look, I just, you know, my parents just, I don't want to hear about what you're doing anymore. You know, because it's very uncomfortable if I talk to them about, oh, I, you know, the footages from the animal slaughterhouse. They, they just, they don't want to know. Um, but my parents are 70 something and they're dealing with health issues at that age. So it's very easy for me to take a different angle and start talking to them about that. And so that's what I would say to get over the disconnect between the food issues. Sir. Hi, um, my, my question is related to what you were speaking about, but more on those people who raise individuals like chickens. Like I was listening earlier and, uh, you know, when we support that, we know that it is not compassionate. You know, you end up killing them, and they deserve their own lives. So my question is, is there a plan for you to transition them? Because there are solutions. For instance, we have lab-grown meat, and they're going to keep their business, spare the lives of chickens. So why is it still being supported? Like, I come from the Philippines, and it was really honestly frustrating to hear that you know, we allow this to happen because I am for animal liberation and I'm, I'm really working so that we will stop. But here, it's like encouraging them to continue. So my question is, are you going to help them transition? And like I heard earlier, and I quote, it's like, they're, you know, like um, chickens are going to be good for children, but we know that it's not. It, so I, I cannot understand why, you know. So can, can you please enlighten me and the rest of us who are really like frustrated and confused, <laughs> especially for the chickens, because we're not supposed to kill them, right? right. Thank you. So I, I can't answer for everyone. Um, I think this comes back to, uh, again, I understand because I've, you know, working in this field for so long that if we can't have immediately everybody on the planet going vegan tomorrow, you know, what do we do about the farm animals? And we can't just turn a blind eye to the suffering. And that is why there is work on improving the animal welfare of the farm animals during this transition time. I can only speak, you know, personally for our campaign um, for the plant forward campaign which we run that we don't talk about farm animals our plant forward campaign focuses on the power of plants the power of you know plant-based health and the p power of sustainability plants being our sustainable future um, but there are many organizations and i think i i think that the, the the amount of suffering is so big the work that we need to do, it, we still have so far to go um, that just because we're pushing for animal liberation, that day is still some time off and we can't turn a blind eye to the suffering that's happening right now. So that there are you know, different organizations d taking different approaches and therefore there will be some organizations who are very legitimately uh, working to improve the animal welfare of the farm animals while there are organizations who are pushing more towards pure plant-based. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I, it's, there's no, yeah, it's basically not a, you know, I can't speak for other organizations, but in terms of, you know, our own organization, we do, we do push for the plant-based message. Thank you, Joy, and thank you to all our speakers. I'll wrap it up because I know our keynote is starting right now, but uh, the speakers might hang around for a little bit if you had other questions or, or follow-ups, but uh, maybe one last final round of applause for all the speakers today. Thank you. Thank you.